Hey guys, welcome to my channel, where we talk about all things true crime, crazy and unknown historical events, ghost phenomena, and more. Plus, I go to some of the locations that I talk about to explore them further. So if any of that is of interest to you, then you should consider hitting the subscribe button and also the bell icon so you can stay in the loop of my upcoming cases and adventures. Recently, my husband and I watched HBO's Love and Death with Elizabeth Olsen, and if you haven't heard of this show or you just haven't seen it yet, I definitely recommend it. It follows Candy Montgomery in the days and months leading up to the murder of her friend, Betty Gore. Ultimately diving into the question, could Candy have committed this brutal axe murder? You may also have heard about the Hulu original named Candy with Jessica Biel, which is based on the same case and came out about a year prior. Both of these shows are very well done and relatively paint the same picture about the case, although I will say that it seemed like in Love and Death that they made Betty seem more judgmental and rude, whereas in Candy it seemed like Betty was more withdrawn and depressed. As you can probably already gather from the intro to this video, the title of the video, these shows are based on the true story, and today we're going to dive into the true case and look at any differences that the show might have depicted. And yes, there will be spoilers, so if you have not seen these shows and would like to watch them before watching this breakdown, definitely go ahead and do so. As you probably already noticed, I do have a little companion here, Honey, and she's just going to be keeping us company while we talk about this brutal axe murder. Alright, let's waste no more time and jump right into the case. In 1977, Candace Candy Montgomery and her family moved to Wiley, Texas, and they started integrating themselves into the community immediately by regularly attending a local church. And it was here that Candy met and befriended another local mother, Betty Gore, who was a fifth grade teacher, and their daughters also became great friends as well. Both of the families were very involved in the church. Betty, her husband Alan, and Candy even sang in the church's choir together. Although life seemed picturesque for both of these families, Behind closed doors, it was a very different story. Put simply, Candy was growing tired of her sex life with her husband Pat, and she felt that at her age, she was too young to deny herself of a thrilling sex life. One night after a church volleyball match, she approached Alan Gore and asked if he would be interested in having an affair. Unbeknownst to Candy, Alan too was having issues with his sex life. Specifically, he was tired of how Betty was so meticulous planning out every detail, and this made it dispassionate for him. I'm very attracted to you. Oh. Would you be interested in having an affair? Candy was basically Betty's exact opposite. She was perky, full of life, and she could make friends with basically anyone because she was so easygoing. At first, Alan seemed a little bit hesitant, however, admittedly, he couldn't get Candy off of his mind, and on her 29th birthday, he called Candy to invite her to lunch so they could discuss what they had talked about before. As the weeks dragged on, Candy and Alan planned the perfect affair, even drawing out a list of whys and why nots to having an affair. Alan called Candy back, saying that he wanted to go ahead with the affair, later meeting to discuss the rules and guidelines. As if this wasn't all too meticulous for him, but anyways. Their affair started on December 12th, 1978, and lasted for several months, and they would always meet at the Como Motel. The two became very close, Candy would make them lunch to enjoy before they would have sex. Candy later claimed that sometimes it wasn't even about the sex, a few times they decided against it altogether and just talked about their lives. However, within two months, Candy was starting to develop feelings towards Alan, and per their agreement, she tried to call it off. Alan, on the other hand, was not ready to end things, and eventually he was able to convince Candy to continue their affair. The affair started to dwindle for both Candy and Alan. First, Candy was growing tired of putting together elaborate lunches for their rendezvous, and Alan, on the other hand, was growing more and more worried about Betty. He began to worry about Betty's pregnancy. She was pregnant with their second child, and he was specifically worried about some of the problems that occurred during her first pregnancy, and he began to fear that she would go into labor while he was with Candy at the Como. 
But by June, both Alan and Candy had agreed to put a stop to their relationship. The Gores finally welcomed their second daughter in early July, which brought the couple closer together and a renewal in their intimacy. However, this was short-lived, and within a month, Alan and Candy were back at the Como. But something was a little different this time. Candy seemed a little detached, while Alan still felt guilty, only this time he felt guilty for leaving Betty at home to tend to the kids alone. One night after Alan and Candy had spent the afternoon together, Betty tried to seduce Alan. Granted, Betty hadn't been feeling sexual, but she knew that Alan was growing distant. However, Betty's plan backfired because Alan just found her advances to be forward and aggressive, and he told her that he wasn't feeling like sex that night. This response made Betty cry because she was now convinced that he didn't love her anymore. Alan tried to reassure her that he still loved her, and a few days later, he officially ended the affair with Candy, stating that this was beginning to affect his marriage. During this time, a program called Marriage Encounters was very popular, and essentially it was a weekend getaway where couples could rediscover their love for each other. The Gores attended one of these weekends, and it really seemed to save their marriage, bringing another renewed sense of passion into their relationship. By the following summer, life had returned to normal for these two families, and the affair seemed to be well behind them by now. However, this all changed on June 13th, 1980. And yes, this happened to occur on Friday the 13th, ironically. Alan had left town that morning to go on a business trip, and their eldest daughter, Elisa, had been staying with the Montgomerys. Candy offered to keep their daughter another night so Betty could focus on the baby, even offering to take Elisa to her swim lesson so Betty wouldn't have to stress about it. Candy left the church where a bunch of the kids were going to put on a show for the parents, and Candy believed that she could go get the swimsuit and run a Father's Day errand before the show started. Once she got to Betty's, however, she could tell something was a little off. Hey, y'all. The two apparently chatted about life and the swim lessons before the conversation quickly switched gears. Betty asked matter-of-factly, are you having an affair with Alan? The two argued for a moment until finally Candy admitted that she had had an affair, but it had been over long ago. According to Candy, Betty got up and left without saying anything, only to return to the room with an axe. Candy pleaded with Betty, reassuring her that the affair had ended, but Betty swung the axe, striking Candy once in the forehead and another time on her right foot. Candy pleaded for her life, and Betty supposedly shushed her, sending Candy into a disassociative state, which reminded her about her mother, who would always shush her. Candy snapped, and she took the axe from Betty, swinging it over and over again because apparently she wouldn't stay down. After all was said and done, Candy had swung the axe a total of 41 times, the 40th whack being the fatal one, meaning Betty was most likely conscious the entire time. You can't have him. And suddenly she had the axe again. You can't have him. You can't have him. I'm going to have another baby. You can't have him. I don't, you can't have him. And I don't want him. Betty, don't do this. <laughs> what are you doing? Very quickly, Candy's trial became the crime of the century, and many people wanted to travel just to get a glimpse of her. Candy hired Don Crowder, who typically practiced civil cases, but took Candy's case as a challenge to him. The two had also met at church, and because of this, 
Crowder was able to get the support of the church on Candy's side. The defense argued that Candy murdered Betty in self-defense, and at first, no one was buying the story until Candy took the stand. She explained the events from her point of view, and the jury was able to see the raw emotions of her retelling the events. Next, the defense brought in the psychiatrist that claimed Candy had entered that disassociative state. He explained in detail what the shush really meant to Candy psychologically. He also explained how he put Candy under hypnosis to get to the root of this trauma. Candy had been struck by a sharp object in the forehead, which left a nasty gash. Little Candy screamed and screamed, and instead of consoling her like a mother should, she pursed her lips, raised a finger to them, and shushed her angrily. Now, when Betty made this same gesture and sound during their altercation, this caused Candy to snap. The jury subsequently deliberated for nearly five hours and came back to the court with a verdict of not guilty. Many were shocked by this and they were sent into an outrage, feeling like Betty wasn't defended properly. But Candy Montgomery was officially acquitted of Betty Gore's murder. Well, I've been here for the, almost the whole trial and I can't believe it. I, everybody's in shock. Actually, when I walked inside, there were the chief of police met me with his four or five, all of his police force was there, as I recall. And I recall that there was a uh, highway patrol officer from the Texas Department of Public Safety, and there must have been 12 or 15 uh, neighbors standing in the living room. Well, this right away is a total violation of, of any crime scene. First, we had to identify for sure if there were any fingerprints on the murder weapon, we had a fingerprint on the freezer, and we had a lot of bloody smears. And we had to discount most of the blood that led from the house out toward the street because we had people tracking in and out. So all of those blood trails going outside, we would have to look at with a jaundiced eye. Now the ones going into the bathroom and uh, the, the, the apparent uh, desire to clean up somebody, uh, their clothing or their, their legs or shoes, that, that was something unusual. And that's where we did take hairs and fibers and blood stains, but not the ones going out toward the street. I found out Betty had been killed. I was at home and uh, it just couldn't, it didn't soak in. I just couldn't really bring myself to think that it would have happened to her. So the family all loaded up and went to Wiley and like say, uh, we, it was very strange at the house, you know, because they had they had cleaned up the house to a certain degree, but I know there was a section of linoleum that was pulled up out of the utility room, you know, and cleaned up and taken out of there, you know, I, and <clears throat> there was still a kind of an outline of a bloody footprint or shoe print on the step going out of the house, you know. Well, to later on to find out that it was Candy and, and then of course discussing the fact that she had been in the house, she had brought food in, you know, she had showed her compassion and her sympathy and, and you know, talked to all the family and, and was so, uh, so concerned, you know, but it's like, how can, how, how can somebody do that? You know, we were, we were all shocked at the length of time it took. We knew that the verdict would be guilty. She didn't claim insanity. She was talking self-defense. We couldn't imagine anybody that would have believed that when she was hit that many times, that it was self-defense. We can't believe that when she went ahead and cleaned up before she went back to Sunday school. I mean, she knew we had, we, that she knew that we had her dead to right. So she had to make an excuse. And her excuse was self-defense. 
and it is because of the affair, the argument they got into, and the disassociative reaction, and that Betty hit her with the ax, and it caused her to, you know, that disassociative reaction, that thinking back or whatever, and she twisted off, and that's what she, the excuse she gave. And it took 12 people to believe it. Afterwards, Candy and the family picked up everything and moved to Georgia. However, Pat and her didn't stay together for much longer, and they divorced shortly after moving. Ironically, Candy became a mental health therapist and specialized in teens and young adults who suffer from depression. She now goes by her maiden name, Candace Wheeler. Not long after the trial, Alan also left Wiley, Texas, and had multiple failed marriages since the murder. His children were adopted by Betty's parents, but in a couple different reports, I did see that he was able to rekindle a relationship with his kids. All in all, I think the two shows did a really good job at retelling the stories in their own manner, basically staying extremely close to the actual events, and the shows both raise thought-provoking questions about the boundaries of friendship, desire, and the human psyche. While the case itself is tragic, the two series does a good job at making you feel for everyone that was involved in a different way, and adds a new perspective into the case that the trial alone might not have. In regards to Candy's story, I personally think it's plausible, however, I think it's a very convenient scapegoat for her as well. I definitely recommend checking out both Candy on Hulu and Love and Death on HBO. I will say that Hulu's version with Jessica Biel wasn't as gory as HBO's version, although the murder is only shown in one scene, it does get a little bit more graphic in the HBO's version. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing which one to watch. After finishing both of the shows though, I did find both to be pretty similar. I mean, for this story, there's not much to embellish. However, like I did mention at the beginning of the video, it did seem like Betty was painted in a bit of a harsher light in Love and Death compared to the other show. But what do you think? Have you seen both of these shows? Would you agree with me that Betty was painted in a different manner in each show? Or if you had never heard of this case or these shows, what are your thoughts? Do you believe Candy's story about going into a disassociative state? Definitely let me know down in the comments below to keep this conversation going. But other than that, that is going to be it for me today. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed already but want to join in on my upcoming cases and adventures, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. But as always, thank you so much for any and all support, and I will catch you in my next upload.